Good afternoon. Welcome to what is sure to be a very insightful 60 minutes. Um, I'm Ali Tripodi from Cedric, and I am so pleased to be moderating today's panel discussion. I'm joined by a really impressive group of panelists who are going to share their unique perspectives on the topics that are impacting our industry and most importantly, your business. Uh, so before we get started with the discussion, let's just do some quick introductions. Um, Tom Simonsek, let's start with you. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone? Sure. Thank you, uh, Allison, and really excited and appreciate uh, a chance to speak today. Thankful for our business partners, both uh, Liberty as well as our contractors. My name is Tom Simonsek. I am the president of Property Americas. And Property Americas is kind of all things property. And from a geography standpoint, includes the United States, Canada, and Latin America. And we have 3,500 full-time professionals and somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 contractors and 1,500 temporary labor uh, helpers. And it is ranges from adjusting to engineering, to desktop, to TPA, to forensics, and the whole uh, whole gamut. I've been in the business since 1988, and again, appreciate being here uh, and with this esteemed panel. Thank you. Great, thanks, Tom. Uh, Jim, how are you today? Terrific, thank you, Allie. My name is Jim Kowalski, and I'm co-owner of Kowalski Construction. We're a third-generation family-owned business here in Arizona. And uh, we're celebrating our 55th uh, anniversary this year, though though I've only been there a short time uh, since 1979. So I cut my teeth in the restoration business here. I'm also the current president of Restoration Affiliates, which is a national organization of independently owned restoration contractors uh, throughout the uh, country. Great, thanks. Thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. All right. Hi, Brooke. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be joining in uh, the conversation today. Uh, my name is Brooke Bass. I work for Liberty Mutual Insurance and I'm the Senior Vice President of Property Claims uh, in the U.S. covering personal lines and small commercial. Great. Thanks for being here. And finally, our other Tom. How are you today? Good. Good. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Tom Avizano. I'm the general manager of the All Pro Cleaning and Restoration, a Belfort company office here in Westchester County, New York. All Pro was my company for 24 years, uh, and I was purchased by Belfort about two years ago. And now I'm part of the Belfort family, although we still operate as All Pro Cleaning and Restoration. So, and again, thank you for having me today. Oh, we're so glad to have you with us. So, thank you. Well, let's let's dive right in. Um, one thing I think that's on everyone's mind, uh, it's no no secret that there are labor shortages, there are disruptions to supply line, um, lots of things that are affecting businesses lately. But what I'd really like to dig into is, um, you know, what are some of the actions that that we're taking to reduce these impacts? Um, and I would would be really curious um, if we want to kind of take that macro view first and then dig down into what are we specifically doing about them. Um, Tom Simonsek, I'd be really curious to, to hear what you've got to say about that macro view. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I speak uh, early and often around this subject, but it is uh, real. And when I think of the macroeconomics, uh, I've been in the business since 1988 and there's always a challenge. It does not matter when you think you figured it out, that's just when you're gonna get, get yourself in trouble. But this one is unique and it is, my, you know, I wasn't around when uh, the inflation was what, what it was like today, but the real concerns are around labor, uh, both lack thereof and, uh, and also the cost of. And I think from a labor perspective, our industry is no different than any other industry and the U.S. is no different than any other place in the world in terms of both those challenges. I do believe our industry, for whatever reason, probably hasn't been as investment driven as we should have been. And so we're, we're feeling some of the effects of getting more people into this business, training and develop. And so now it's kind of a double-edged sword. In addition, you have things like the supply chain issue that's real and it impacts the ability to get things in our contractor. Partners are far more eloquent in terms of what's going on in that. And then you have this overall inflation. And so the kind of the combination being able to service the business, both regular day, regular business, and then the ability to surge 
are impacted. And the things that we see occurring, at least from my vantage point, are really as follows. It is the inability to get good people potentially leads to uh, changes in the, in the way the claim is handled, both from a cost and a service experience, accuracy, timeliness, and the overall experience. You then talk about from the supply chain issue and you start talking about labor being more expensive, cost of materials moving in and out, whether it's lumber, obviously driving up the additional cost, and then the factor of trying to get the work done as quickly as it used to be. So if a typical fire, if there is anything typical, was 60 days or 90 days of ALA or ALE, I should say, that suddenly is no longer possible or doesn't appear to be. And if you're on a commercial loss, the business income. So from a Sedgwick perspective, trying to provide what we believe are differentiated value-driven solutions are more difficult in light of those particular situations and cause us to spend a considerable amount of time, which we'll talk about, trying to do things differently or trying to apply a different approach for a different solution but they're all real and the impact on insurance carriers is potentially profound, both from an experience and a cost. The impact on Sedgwick is it cost us a lot more money to do our business today and do it just as well. And then who had ultimately kind of helps pay for all that. And that's, you know, that is where I, I see uh, the world. And when you're getting a cat further uh, exacerbated and so you wind up in the situation we are, but there are plenty of solutions. We're probably not interested in talking about problems all day and we'll get to that at some point. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. You had mentioned something about, um, you know, thinking differently, doing things differently. So, um, Brooke, I would be really curious to hear, you know, from your perspective, what are some of those things that need to be done differently in this kind of environment? Yeah, um, great. I, I wanted to pick up on a, a couple of things Tom said um, with regard to the labor piece in particular. Um, I, I, you know, as we all know, the, the property claims and restoration um, industry and experience is incredibly complicated. Um, there are so many scenarios that lead to a loss and then so many scenarios that you encounter as you're sort of helping the customer through that process and getting them back to whole. Um, and the tenure and experience of our folks um, in that entire ecosystem is really critical to delivering a great experience and a great outcome um, all around. So in the situation we've been finding ourselves in the last sort of two years um, with the dynamic labor market and quite frankly, just outright shortage um, has been challenging for us in terms of being able to bring to bear the full sort of experience of, you know, a 20 year adjuster, the knowledge that they have of policies and the way that our restoration partners work and how to deliver that great experience for our customer. As we recruit new people, as we bring them on board in numbers, um, because we're both growing as a business, but also because the industry, um, you know, is experiencing this labor shortage we're seeing the need to change the way we onboard people, the way we train them, the way we bring them that experience in a much shorter um, time period so that they can deliver, um, you know, in their first year of employment with us in maybe their first year of handling a property claim in a way that someone who was typically much more experienced could do. Um, and that's something that we're facing right now. So we're partnering you know, with our training groups. Um, we are reimagining re our onboarding experience. We're thinking about ways in which we can engage um, virtually with partners um, in that process as well. Um, so for us, that's been the critical thing that we've been problem solving on um, is how do we bring, um, you know, a relatively young workforce up to speed so that we don't have um, any lapses in the way that we deliver that service for our customers and the way that we engage with our partners. Hey, Allie, can I jump in and make a comment? Because one of the things that I think is really different about what we provide in the policyholders uh, experience, uh, if we go out to a restaurant and they are short on labor, we expect to have a little slower service, right? We realize the impact that all of this is having on us. The things that we do more frequently that are impacted 
become more accepted and more commonplace. But few policyholders have very many much experience with a loss until they do. So it's almost a sudden realization that, well, wait a minute, you mean there's going to be delays here too? And that's sort of interesting because we we have come to be conditioned almost to accept it as part of our normal daily lives, waiting for something, uh, whether it's a restaurant table or, or something else, it's the service. But when it comes to something that we haven't experienced, we don't necessarily realize that it's been affected as well. Kind of the light bulbs pop off on there, you know, and, and, and all of a sudden that stark realization hits them at a time that's you know not necessarily favorable in their life. They might be dealing with a, a full fire reconstruction for the first time ever, and, and they're at one of their worst spots in their life. And now the realization of all of this is settling in. And it's uh, it, it takes a little bit of finesse to kind of work through some of that. That's a great point, Jim. I was, I was gonna come back to Brooke real quick, and I, I was interested in something you said, and it was around, uh, you know, the diversification of your workforce relative to more generational, a generational view, right? And as the experiment is, maybe it's not an experiment, but it's, you know, it's what can you tell me or tell us like the, the kind of the pros and cons, because you've been forced to in some ways, but you're now on to a new way of thinking about the business by getting um, a little more uh, the generational impact of this. So love to hear what you, how that's going so far. I'm sure, I mean, obviously the uh, on the con side, right? Uh, as folks uh, leave the workforce, both from retiring and, and seeking new and different opportunities, right? We lose a, an incredible um, amount of years, decades, hundreds of years of experience, right? In the way that, um, you know, we've been serving our customers in the technical aspect of estimating uh, a loss and, you know, working with partners on the entire experience. But I think on on the pro side, we're gain we're finding that we're gaining um, a little bit of a new mindset around um, what good looks like and what good could look like in the industry and for our customers. Um, quicker adoption of new technologies, ideas to um, create connection uh, with our partners and with our customers. Um, that just that you know, whether it's from a younger generation or folks who haven't worked in our industry before and are now sort of just finding um, those opportunities to join us, there's an incredible amount of energy around a path forward, right? And um, the seeing opportunities to change as good things and to change for the better in service of our of our customers. Um, so uh, we're, we're loving tapping into that energy right now um, and seeking to make improvements um, across our business in the way that we deliver um, that service for our customers because we have um, that diversity of thought, the diversity of experiences, the energy around trying new things. Um, and quite frankly, as well, I'm sure we'll get into, right, the, the customer needs uh, and the customer expectations are changing so rapidly in this also environment that we're seeing labor and materials and and other underlying factors change so rapidly that we also have a little bit of um, connection there um, with new adjusters who are thinking like customers. Not to say that you know our experienced adjusters don't think like customers, but some of our adjusters most recently were customers, right? They they weren't working uh, you know in adjusting for twenty plus years. They most recently their experience whether it's on the auto or property side, has been a, as a policyholder and a customer. So we're kind of seeing that new lens come into play, which is really helping us focus, you know, as we like to think we're very customer centric, right? The customer's experience is really at the center of everything we're trying to do and get better at. So uh, that's a huge pro that we're seeing. I think, well, I think something that what Jim was alluding to or brought up is, is important too is, which is a positive to a degree is um, I think it, for a long time as a contractor, the vendors and the contractors were seen as a team and, and the insureds were, were on the other end, you know, expecting us to be together. I think the current climate and how well publicized it's been, customers understand that there's supply chain issues now. They, they get that. I don't know if they want to know about our labor issues, but they, but they get the supply chain issues. And, um, I've almost found, and we'll get into that later about what we're doing to try to overcome this. It's, it's 
always been communication has always been the key to all of this, right? Is uh, is we're finding though that there's a little bit more sympathy to the fact that I can't really tell you when those kitchen cabinets are coming, and, and you know we're gonna we're gonna keep updating you and telling you that the delays, but at the end of the day, it's out of our control. And I think from a different than in the past, they understand that now a little bit better. And we're finding that we're getting a little bit more support in that way to a degree. So, Tom, yeah, I that's, to that's, that's, that's a great, uh, that is a great point. I think in some ways we've all lowered our um, service level expectations in some level, the restaurant experience and probably good for blood pressure to do that. And it's helpful, but it does, but it, it's, it's transparent, Tom, as you say, or there's communication around that. And when it's not, it, it, it leads to a bunch of the historical challenges. And I find that the businesses that are more direct, whether it's going out to a restaurant or I'm, I'm building a house now, I mean, the more transparent is the, the, our, the builder and contractor is gonna be involved in the better. And I encourage his company to do that. I encourage this to be open and honest about stuff because I'm in the space, I know what's gonna happen. And, and that way we can all collectively really deal with those hard issues when they're the real hard issues as opposed to all the noise around stuff. So you guys have a hard, I tell you, you guys got a hard, hard road and my hat's off to you. It's always been hard, but it's really hard now. Yeah, I, I would I would love to, to build on that point because I think we're seeing that same um, need for transparency and communication and, and quite frankly, um, sort of uh, togetherness with the carrier side and the partner side to make sure we're all on the same page and that we're communicating in the same way to our customers and we're being transparent and that the entire system right is working in that way i'll, I'll just sort of share you know further proof um that being upfront and honest and communicating and being transparent and and then resetting expectations if you can't deliver on that um is hugely important um you know our friends at, at jd power have found that while cycle time is correlated with overall satisfaction, it isn't the only thing that is important. In fact, it's not the number one thing. It's actually how we communicate those expectations and then deliver on them. And so if we tell a customer something's gonna take seven days and it takes 15, they're not going to be happy. If we tell them it's going to take 15 and it takes 14 or 15, they're actually much more satisfied than the customer who was told something at you know seven days and it took 10. so their cycle time was 10 to 15 but the 15 day customer was much happier because they were trans we were transparent and we actually met that expectation and so that just reminds me every day right that it's human nature to be um to not want to have right to shy away from tough dis decision discussions or have those difficult conversations with the customer about yeah i don't really know when your kitchen cabinets are going to come in. i don't really know you know where we're going to find comparable housing in this market that you live in it's very constrained but we shouldn't shy away from those difficult you know discussions because that's what the customer is expecting from us and there's proof in real hard industry data that they're much more satisfied when we do engage in that way with them so to tag on to what brooke is saying it, it, she said uh to not shy away from it i, I think maybe more accurately to embrace it and I think that what, um, so like everybody else, we have a communication SOP about, you know, keeping uh, people informed, but I break it down to the three simple steps. So tell them what you're going to do, tell them what you're doing, and then tell them what you've done. And I find that the more often we're able to communicate about these difficult topics, the more uh, trust we build with the policyholder who then sees that we're not trying to dodge it. Um, yes, we don't have any more information by communicating more often than, than we do by communicating less, but at least they know that we're there and that we haven't forgot them. And I think that really is a, a key point of, uh, of managing. It always has been, but I think it's even more critical now uh, during all this uncertainty. Uh, I think an, an important backdrop to all this too is, you know, everybody says, well, how is your business affected by all this? Well, as we all know, it was a busy year. I mean, it didn't affect us in terms of volume of business this year, right? We were we were busy. So all these setbacks are occurring while the workload is maybe higher than in previous years. You know, we had national uh, up here, we had Ida this year, we had a bunch of stuff that, so 
I think that's just putting more pressure on the whole process. But as we were saying, I think, you know, it makes it easier to be upfront about what's going on. It really is. And I, I think if you're not communicating, I mean, we, when we start, and it's mostly on the repair end, right? The mitigation that still moves pretty quickly. And, and um, but on the repair end, I mean, we're including all the management on the reports that go out so that if people feel like they need to get another answer, we're not finding that's the case though. We're, we're finding that they're, you know, as long as we're communicating and sending those weekly and bi-weekly reports, that they're uh, they're going along with it at this point, for the most part. Tom, Tom, Tom just to push back, there's, and I, I agree with you, it was really, really busy. But from our vantage point, and I think most insurance carriers, and I assume most, most organizations, the pressure on profitability is there. It's real. And we had a bunch more work last year, and we saw our, our operating margins decline because of this fact and it's difficult these are i was thinking about setting yourself up for success and and when we have really good success is when we have good hard challenging provocative innovative ways and when we just kind of don't do that and we are not as transparent we don't communicate what you do is you've all things considered you get yourself in a place where i gotta take some shortcuts and i've got to do things that aren't very good but I will tell you, as busy as we were, we have seen in the, across the company a challenge around the, in, the the inflation, which is real, and the margin compression. And for us, that does matter, and it really impacts us. And I know the insurance companies feel a lot of the same. And it's just it's it's the cost of the claims, and then it's the indemnity, and you know they're all driven around, you know, uh, if they get their loss ratios or combined ratios down. And I mean, it, it is difficult and it requires us all to collectively think differently because if we just assume all costs can get passed off i can tell you from our vantage point we can't pass them all off we have not been successful they were just not very good at articulating and that could be part of it but it's hard to do and it's hard for i assume the insurance company is hard for you guys it's it's difficult and so trying to a be transparent open honest have good conversations then also think about the need for change and how do you become more efficient and maybe you do hire in um, different labor pool challenges. I mean, today I decided sometime in the summer of last year that the same pond that all the people in my space are fishing in, it does not have enough fish and it is not a great place because we're all pulling back out old damaged uh, mercenary type of labor that does not satisfy the obligations and does so at an exorbitant price. And so we've kind of reset our thinking and whether it's generational, whether it's a different skill set, doesn't necessarily have to be a college degree. Maybe it's going into, you know, somebody wants to put nails into a board or that's what they're doing. And maybe they want to do more look like us. Uh, and if you're, if, and we've been forced to be really creative because there is a limit on our time, our talent and our treasures. And we've got to figure out how to maximize all of it. And that's been the real challenge. Meanwhile, servicing the clients just as well as we ever have, and they're real. These costs have really, I mean, they're, they're math, they're just, they're, they're large. And when you have an organization, I don't know, we do $4 billion and we have 30,000 colleagues, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six percent cost increases are, 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 are real. So um, that's, you know. And I think that expense is, is um, translated throughout the, all the organizations we spoke about, you know, communicating more frequently with the policyholders. Well, that adds to the time that the staff has to spend um, following up on your material suppliers. You know, we're waiting on that material and we keep following up to see when it's going to be in. They don't have answers. We, we can't get answers, but we keep trying. And all that extra effort and energy that goes into doing what we used to do before with less results, we're, we're not getting that material. We're not getting those answers and we're working harder to get them. And it's taxing on the staff, it's taxing on the policyholder, um, and it costs more money because we're spending more time and time is money. Sure. Yeah, and I think one of the things that Tom brought up earlier too is is the you know, we have the communication with our clients, but our communication with our vendors and our salespeople. Like when we were, you know, having the bell for behind me, I, we were pretty on top of where our expenses were and where we were going, but we were getting sub bills and vendor bills who weren't necessarily on top and we'd price it at one price and then get a bill and be like, oh, 
there's a, there's a shortage out there. We're like, we knew that. There was a shortage two weeks ago when we asked you for the price and you didn't give us that price, you know? Um, so I think it's it's coming down at every level, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's from the guy who delivers the plastic bags to us all the way you know, to to our our subs, they, it's hard for them to have the wherewithal to stay on top of this as it's changing so rapidly. So how they're getting those to us is delayed, which is delaying, you know, triggering all the way down the line. I'm intrigued by your business because at the end of the day, it feels like you have to have a human being doing something. I mean, I, yeah, I'm not sure that there's yet a, a robot or anything that puts a nail in the in the shingles, right? It feels much more like human beings have to do that. But yet you also have these pressures to figure out how to get more efficient in different ways. Or, and I'm anxious to see what Jim or Tom, because for us, we're thinking, you know, technology feels like if you can, we'll talk about that later. But if you can get a, if you can get a bot, a combination of bot and AI, and we can, nobody even touches the claim. I mean, that is where things could be. It's an algorithm and, and you get the claim answered. And, and if we get to that point, we solve some of our labor crunch and you take whatever is left and you put it on a larger, more complex claim and you build capacity that way. At least that's the way I think about it. But from your perspective, is is there technology out there that is changing the way or is it all the behind the scenes stuff in terms of, you know, inventory control or labor or logistical control or is, do you see anything that's going to help kind of make you guys more efficient? I, I mean... There's technology issues coming about every day that's helping the process, but nothing that's addressing these concerns. You know, there really isn't. And like you said, is, you know, I, I I'll take me for instance. I was very fortunate in that you know we got hit hard during COVID. You know, here in New York, we could not work in any of the buildings in Manhattan that we normally work in, and we saw six months into 2020, we were really really behind the eight ball a little bit, and um. You know, I was fortunate to be part of a bigger company at that point who said, don't lose anybody. Do not let anybody walk out the door. Keep them busy. We had the cleanest warehouse in America for, for, for a couple of months there. Um, but we were fortunate. So when when latter half of that year and into this year where things picked up, we were fortunate to still have that. Replacing those people is going to be a lot more challenging down the line. But we were able to jump out there so and, and still satisfy our clients that way. But it you know right now we've slowed down a little bit and and we're looking to add people and boy do we see how hard that is right now quality people people that i people that i would have hired five years ago you know and and maybe i'm interviewing people now that i wouldn't have even interviewed five years ago because i'm looking for you know i'm a blind squirrel looking for a nut somewhere out there you know and uh it's not easy and add to that you know we we do background checks and um all of that so it's it sort of uh, reduces the amount of, uh, of labor that is available to you. And um, so you take a tight market, you run it through the filter of uh, background checks, it get, becomes even tighter. And uh, there's, you know, there's certain things that we can't um, uh, uh, reduce our standards on and that, and that being one of them. And uh, so it, it does certainly create because there are other industries perhaps that uh, don't need to be as stringent. And so that labor pool is available to them. But in our industry, that's not necessarily one of them that uh, would make sense to, to relax the standards on. I just, and while we're on the labor part, I think it's important to say the, the changing mentality of the labor force now too. Not everybody wants to go go knee deep in a sewer filled basement anymore. You know, there's, there's other jobs out there because there's labor shortages everywhere. So maybe they have a pick of something that they want to do that isn't related to what we do, which is not easy. It's not easy work, you know? Yeah, no doubt. And it's, it's not necessarily the most attractive. Um, I remember seeing years ago and they did a survey of, um, of uh, young adults entering in the workforce on the most desirable positions and Construction was second to the last. We beat out cowboy, but that was it. And so um, not necessarily sexy or attractive for a lot of people, um, which uh, again, just places a, a, a smaller pool from which to draw upon. What are some of those things that you're finding um, are working or some creative problem solving that you're having to do to attract that talent? Um, maybe those who don't want to be cowboys, but are, are good with construction. 
<laughs> so there's a, there's a lot we're trying to do. Um, w one is that we have um, refocused. So HR has always been HR, but we now recognize the um, recruiting component is so much more important. So um, we've added another HR person just to focus on recruiting. We do more advertising for our positions. In the past, you advertised when you needed to hire. Now we advertise all the time because we are always hiring. And um, we're working with uh, the local colleges on trying to um, uh, interest those maybe who would not consider uh, trades. We're doing internal training um, so that we can take somebody that maybe doesn't have any experience and, uh, and actually give them hands-on training in our warehouse and, and start a program there. Um, we're working with um, other countries on uh, bringing workers in uh, to the country to be able to help satisfy our, our work uh, force. So there's a lot that we can do. We're doing hiring fairs all the time, um, just trying to be out there, trying to be proactive. And um, we're finding social media has been very effective for us uh, because while uh, we may connect with somebody on social media who already is gainfully employed and, and happy in what they're doing, they maybe have somebody that they're connected to that, you know, has not uh, had the exposure to us. And so we're able to leverage the, the, the power of social media and, uh, and help recruiting through those, uh, those tools. For, for all of the um, negative things we could probably uh, lament about today's tech technology world and social media and the, the effects it has on us as humans. I think you bring up a great point in terms of how enabled we are now, though, at finding people and attracting people and getting our message out to people that we would have had to work so hard to find before or probably didn't even know were out there and existed. And, you know, we've had a tremendous success as well these last couple of years with virtual career fairs, with working with our recruiting partners to reframe what a career in uh, property insurance is right and it, it you know yes there are technical aspects of our work that our folks and, and your folks need to be good at and need to develop like a skill set to and and they can't sort of make those mistakes but you know we have been talking to folks about at the end of the day why why do you want to go into the sewer filled basement because that customer right is in a really tough spot and you are the person who is helping them get out of that tough spot, right? And you have a technical expertise to do so, and there aren't millions of you out there for that customer to call to help them, right? And so we've been really sort of building this broader, like what are we really doing in, in property insurance and property claims and, and the restoration business, right? It's, it's really helping people. Um, yeah. And that combination of the virtual technologies and social media and our ability to speak our message to a wider variety of folks out there in just about every geography out there has been a, a real benefit to to us the last couple of years that's yeah, a great point Brooke. in terms of just you you've moved to a younger generation moving that direction to one that in, and these are very big generalizations we're making by but who appear to be a little more socially aware who use social media and that there's a noble cause behind all this stuff because i actually think it's a noble profession what we do we actually in the greatest one of the great moments of despair is when they have an event and they're not seasoned at it and he or she has these moments and when we actually go in and then during a CAD actually help not only restore those dreams and hopes and aspirations, but we do it in a, in a large scale community. It does matter and it goes with very little recognition and in our inability over a period of time to articulate that in a more meaningful way has, has probably created some of the challenges that were now exacerbated by the kind of the, the, the micro or the macro economics. But I you know, I, I applaud you. And I, I, I start with thinking about how do we take care of the current colleagues we have better. Mm -hmm. And you then get challenged in a, in a pandemic where you don't see them as often. And the nuances around, it'd be great to have them there because we all believe there's some level of connectivity engagement that works well. But we're also aware that if we tell everybody they have to do this in this day and age, then maybe they're not going to be there. And from my vantage point, I we are spending, and I spend a lot of my time, it is one thing to compensate people correctly, and we've had to make some adjustments and we'll continue. 
but at the end of the day, if that's all we have to offer, somebody else is going to do better. And it's, it, it's an inevitability that will occur. And for us, you know, winning hearts and minds, and you talk about the noble cause, I mean, people respond like that. And the kind of people you want in your organization realize that if I want to do something different, maybe I can make a couple of dollars more. But if I really believe in what we're trying to do, if I believe that somebody cares, if they're engaged, they're investing, training, kind of all the stuff we've always done, but if you, for us, if we, it's hard enough to go get more people, but if we don't keep the ones we have, and so we measure and we monitor and we have a lot of processes in place that looks at attrition. I mean, more so than ever before, looks at customer, uh, you know, uh, colleague engagement scores. And we, from my vantage point, the business I run, that is top of mind. If we don't get that piece right, no matter how well we try to serve your company or a bunch of others, we're not going to get there if we don't take care of our own people. Hard enough to go find more. We got to take care of the ones. And so our effort has been dramatic in terms of the investment, not only in pay, but in, in overall compensa uh, compensation and all these different things you can offer people, but also in how you treat and take care of people. And if you don't start that day every day with a really great attitude, you're going to make a difference in somebody's life. How do you expect that colleague to go out and make a difference on behalf of you and, and the policyholders? Yeah. And it sounds think... soft and fuzzy, but I, uh, there is not much left. I mean, there, you have to have some so things in place. What we're saying, you know, so much of what we're talking about here, you know, the you know, wait till you need employees to build up your reservoir of potential candidates, you know, taking care of your employees. This is all stuff that we should always be doing, right? But it brings these spotlights on it to make us rethink it. I, I was a consultant in a different industry 30 years ago, and I used to tell people, if you're waiting to hire somebody to, to, re, to start look for people until you need somebody, you're behind the eight ball. You should be building up that, have people in the reservoir. Easier said than done though, but when it comes to the, but I do think, and, and I do firmly believe in, in setting up the environment for people to succeed and, and, and all the pros of what we do. And it's not just taking sewer out of somebody's basement. Yes, it's about helping people and preventing loss of revenue and all those things that we try to get across. But I do think the bottom line of this situation is it's costing us more money. We, we have to pay the people we have more money. And really the eye opener for me was when I started recruiting and saw what people were requiring me to pay them. And I'm thinking this person has no experience and I've got this guy's worked for me for 15 years and he's not making that. But I got to go take sure. care of that guy now because I can't bring this person in. And, you know, so I think unfortunately it, it is really that part of it and i think we're still feeling the effects of that i think we're still trying yeah. to figure that out and think about think about the gas shortage i mean that or the gas issue now and you're and we want people to come back in the offices and people haven't been coming in they're they may not be excited but they used to pay whatever they did and now all of a sudden you're going to ask them to come in and and come into the office for the first time in a while and be committed and you're and we're trying to do that and, and then you toss this Gas, gas piece on top, and it it's a rep, recipe for if you're not really thinking all these things through. You, it's one thing to say, "Oh, I'll have to do it." It's either that or you lose your job, and I just don't feel like that's the solution. That it has to be more nuanced, and you know everything was going great, but now we're going to ask people to come back to work potentially, and you're going to pay three, four, five, six, seven dollars a, ga a gallon. That's it's that's that that's it's full of danger. One of the things that we're trying to focus on a lot more, oftentimes construction uh, is viewed as a job, right? As opposed to a career. So we're working with existing staff to understand maybe their career objectives, try to show them a path, get them on board with uh, the proper training and help them see a way to reach their career objectives as opposed to just, you know, um, waiting for a, an opportunity to promote somebody. And so um, when we are having conversations with new hires, that's part of the conversation now is where would you like to be? And fortunately, we don't like some of the answers. Um, you know, you have somebody coming in brand new, zero experience, and in two years they want my job, right? And uh, I think that's just part of the young generation that, that, that's growing up with everything happens so rapidly. Uh, so, but we have to understand where they're coming from to try to help guide them. And so we say, okay, if, if this is what your objective is, here's what you need to do in order to achieve that. Then they realize, oh, that's a, you know, that's a lot longer path than I had anticipated, but it brings reality back into the conversation. So um, like Tom A was saying, 
you've, you've got it not only, you know, if you're if new people walking in the door that we saw uh, a fast food restaurant around the corner offering a thousand dollar sign on bonus, uh, you know, so uh, to, to flip hamburgers. So uh, that's what we're up against out there in the marketplace. So if the new people are coming in and we're having to up our game with them, we need to make sure we're taking care of the existing staff as well. And so it's a it's a it's a bit of a balancing act. This is a really you know important topic in our industry, and I and I wanted to connect it back actually to what we were talking about before with, you know, just the increased cost of doing business, um, because I think we're trying to look at these things together. I we're doing a lot as well as as all of you have talked about in terms of retention of our current workforce, and you know, creating an engaging place for them to have a career um, and to make a difference is really important. And I think one of the ways in which we're doing that is taking a look at our current environment as well, right? So we're all for profit businesses, right? We have an interest in maintaining, you know, being a going concern and growing our businesses and being there for our customers, right? Like we, we do need, you know, to continue to sort of be alive as a business, right? So we can't just continue to pass around these increase cost to each other and ultimately to the customer, right? That that just doesn't, it's not an option for all of us. So we do need to look at our business. We do need to look at our processes. We do need to look at the way that we operate today and say, how can we do that better so that we can absorb some of these costs, right? And still achieve our business goals, which help us in turn grow, provide more jobs for folks, serve more customers, right? And so what we're doing too, to connect that back to the workforce is, to really get them engaged in that problem solving, right? You're out there every day, living our processes, serving our customers. Where do you see that we have opportunities to do things differently, right? Like, where do you interact with other companies who are doing things in a totally different way? And how can we sort of leverage some of those ideas? And that creates really great engagement among, uh, you know, and retention among our workforce because they feel that, Right, they're part of you know the evolution of our business. They're part of problem solving tough challenges that we have, and that um, they feel valued, right, and and respected in that way. And so I think it we can sort of not necessarily solve all our cost problems, but these two things to to me are a little bit linked in terms of how can right. you create more engagement with your current workforce and also help evolve your business. Right, you've got a pool of people who are sort of experts in the way you're currently delivering service that probably have a lot of ideas about how you could be doing it better. I think that what Ed, when you were talking really struck me was that uh, one thing we always say at, at down at our at our office is that A players like to work with A players. And so uh, there's this tendency to want to hire um, a, a warm body, right? We just need bodies, we need people. But the risk of doing that is that you bring people into the system that don't match your culture. And when you've got people out there that are really putting their mind, their body, and their soul into their work, then you bring somebody else in to work alongside of them that is not doing the same, it can be a slippery slope. So um, I, I agree with you tapping into that resource, giving them a voice, making them a part of the solution, I think because um, they'll be more engaged and the more engaged they are, the more fulfilled they will be and it'll be a more rewarding career for them. I'm really curious to know, um, just talking about asking them to engage in problem solving and having all these intersecting challenges and having to be more creative. So um, Tom and Jim, I would love to know from your perspective, what are some best practices and solutions that you've been able to put in place that have been working that are more creative problem solving to either combat uh, you know, timing or labor issues uh, or the cost? Um, so, again, focusing on the communication factor, um, I think that was huge for us. We really much more open dialogue with our customers of where we are, what to expect. I mean, even, I mean, I know we're not really covering that in here, but being in New York, the whole COVID situation was just a nightmare. I mean, even as in December, you know, we're dealing with a rush of work that came in and then all of a sudden half our workforce, half our subs workforce and half our clients came down with COVID here. We had a huge outbreak in December. And um, 
you know, I, I used to I used to get up in those days and look at the calendar and two guys would call in sick or a customer would cancel and I'd lose my mind, you know, and, and I was looking at days where I had 10 people calling in and five customers saying they couldn't have us come. You just you got beaten down a little bit, but you realize that everybody understood and the customers understood that we I mean, to think of five years ago saying, hey, my staff is sick today. We're not going to make it to the job. You know, it just would never have flew, you know, and, and now they're like, oh, no, I get it. I get it. You know, we, we not everybody, but for the most part. Um, so I think communication, I think, you know, biweekly reports. Here's where we are. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we did. Here's the timing and here's what we don't know. You know, we're expecting this to come in next week. Um, I think that communication also in terms of the materials cost, I think we were pretty good with that, you know, and I think everybody was pretty good with it. We, we were experiencing, everybody understood we were experiencing, whether it was the carriers, whether it was whoever saying, hey, look, you know, that job was priced last year. You know, that's, that's the material cost or double that now. So I think communicating that um, was, was, was really helpful. Um, I think really going after the communication with our subs so that we could get them up to speed. You know, it's, it's uh, our, our, we're, you need to forecast better. Do you need a van? Like, are your vans getting near the end of their life? Because you can't get a van, you know? Uh, where are you going to get that van from, you know? And, and trying to coach them and make them better business people so that they could give us better information. Again, that's all communication, I think. Um, I think the part of this that's the practice that we haven't figured out yet is these labor costs because they're, you know, the, the material costs were quick up front and in your face. You know, these labor costs are coming in over time, and that's something we need to we we need to keep gauging and seeing where we are and um and how we're going to do that. But but I, I think the majority of our best practices around this, I think communication on all levels was was certainly the biggest factor. And I agree with that 100%. In addition, some of the things that we're doing, there's this balance between um, engaging employees and burning them out through the engagement. And so it, it's, the, it's the same concept. We have too many meetings or the meetings go on too long. And my staff says, all we ever do is sit in meetings. If we have them too infrequently or they're not long enough, they say, we don't know what's going on around here. So it's this balance, trying to find that. And so we're having... Um, we, uh, we belong to the EOS and right now we're, we're doing the uh, death by meeting uh, Patrick Lencioni wrote a book and uh, it's a really good, uh, read about, you know, what you can do to make your meetings more effective and engaging. And so beyond that with the staff and, and every staff member is involved in some sort of meeting, the duration and the frequency change depending on the position, but we, we get everybody involved and then we're bringing in our vendor partners, our material suppliers, our subcontractors into those meetings um, every once in a while, getting the communication, like Tom said, helping them to maybe navigate through some of this as well, see see some of the um, potential pitfalls that they're not really paying attention to right now, have more communication with them about the, the um, working together and building that synergy uh, so that we are more in harmony with them uh, because we're all dealing with this, no matter whether it's the policyholder, the contractor, or the insurance company, we're all dealing with the same issues. So the better that we can all understand each other and come together, the better the solution we can be able to provide. Well, I I'd like to touch on that communications um, point because I, I, I agree. I think that is probably the biggest area of opportunity in the environment that we're working in. It always has been, but it's now ever more important. And, you know, the way that, that we're trying to think about it too, a little bit, you, you could take the extreme position that every unprompted phone call, email, text message, app chat, what have you, that comes to you from a customer is unwarranted, i.e. they are reaching out to you because there's something they don't know or they're curious about, or you have not delivered to them, right? Now that's an extreme view, but if you take that view, you quickly try to problem solve the communication issue in terms of proactivity, in terms of self-service, in terms of how do I deliver information to my customers in a really clear, concise, and efficient way, uh, and take all that incoming communication out of the system, and then it lets your people focus on the other aspects like 
actually doing work at the customer's house or, you know, actually writing the estimate or, you know, like doing the parts of the job that aren't about just answering questions that you could in other ways have already answered by being proactive in your communication, by thinking about it, um, you know, different like leveraging technology to deliver, you know, communication digitally. Um, and so we're, we're sort of going to that one extreme to, to think about how can we sort of reinvent and not to say that the goal is to prevent incoming communication, that's not what I'm saying, but to think about all that communication that comes in that is really more work on your folks' plate that actually isn't productive communication, right? That actually is adding work into the system and adding inefficiencies and how can we solve for that in a different way? And so, um, you know, we're, we're trying to think about that right now because I think that will help our, our customers and our partners and our agents as well um, because a lot of that will be digital communication and then there's a record, a history, a thing you can keep coming back to to see it there versus a phone call that you may have forgot the details or if I didn't write it right down what my adjuster was saying or my contractor was saying, I forget and I call them later again, right? So, um, you know, that that's something that I think we're we're really working on now. Do you think about that in terms of division of labor, meaning trying to get the right skill sets to address the, the, the issue at hand as well? You know, do you, do you it, if you've got a 30 year really good technician who knows how to handle a, a policy coverage and having that person involved in something where there's no value added, do you guys think about it that way? Brooke? There's absolutely that, that benefit um, to it, right? And sort of making sure that your, um, especially in this day and age, right? You're, you're hiring the right people with the right skills and asking them then to do the right things that maximize, you know, those skills and capabilities and that you're not asking them to do things that, um, you know, one, the customer doesn't want you to pay that person to do or uh, the customer wouldn't want you to pay that level of a person to do, right? Or that skill set to do. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, while it may not be the problem we're solving it's a uh it's part of the problem sure. and it's an absolute benefit in solving for it you sort of right size right uh and think about matching skill set to the work and comes right back around to the engagement piece too right so if people feel like their skills and capabilities are one being developed and two then being maximized to add value they're much happier right mm -hmm. good point I'm um, hearing so much about creative problem solving, and I would be really curious to see if, if any of you have seen any really creative problem solving from contractors on sites, um, whether that be for, you know, combating timing issues, for example, with supplies not coming in in time. Um, what are you seeing that contractors are doing that they have the power to, to creatively solve? So one of the things that we're doing and um, we started doing it right away out of necessity. You go to order materials and, and you never know what the lead time is or what the availability is. Um, I just walked the final job, a $750,000 residential house fire that we, we got a final on on Friday. Um, the microwave was ordered eight months ago, right? You can't just go to the store and get it the week that you need it. And so what we're finding is that we're, we're pre-ordering the material right up front now what we started doing is we started doing that we started warehousing it and i started filling up my warehouses very very quickly um but it and and the other challenge that we have is that a policyholder who has just experienced a loss is not really in the very beginning stages excited about picking out their floor tile right right now they've got to relocate and figure out which end is up and all the rest of that stuff so we almost take like a parenting role, like take this medicine, you won't like it, but it'll be good for you and get them engaged in the process. And what we find is it's therapeutic because it helps them see the finished product instead of the current reality. And so there's is a benefit to them, but we we really move. And so we everybody of course has a goal and when they wanna be back in and at some part of the year, no matter what, if the job is anywhere near, they wanna be in by Christmas, right? And so we, we create a schedule right up front and then we show them what that schedule looks like. So if if that's what their goal is, this is what we need from them. They're our partner. We can't do it for them. They have to help with the selections of this a part of the process. And so 
we're, we're engaging them very early on. We're explaining them the, the challenges that we're running into. We're pre-ordering the material. We're warehousing that material. And, you know, we just had a shipment of, I think it was refrigerator, some sort of appliances that all came in. We were really excited because we got them. They didn't have any of the microchips in them. So what good are they, right? They got shipped out to us, but we don't, we can't use them. So getting that material early, we can, we can evaluate it, confirm that it's the right material, that it's what we need, and that'll help to shorten the amount of time. Now it comes with a cost because we're warehousing it, but it cuts down and particularly for a commercial restoration, the business interruption is uh, quite dramatic. So if we can shorten that cycle time down, then it will pay dividends even at a little bit extra expense. I agree. Everything you just said, that's, we're doing the same. We ordered supplies way quicker than we used to. And, and it, in some ways it's, it's more efficient. In some ways it's got some overhead attached to it, but it's, it is definitely, I would say singly, the biggest thing we've changed is how quickly we order supplies now, materials. We keep, um, so weekly we put out, um, one of our general superintendents uh, coordinates this, we put out a, a list of the, um, the lag time or the, um, that on all of the products that we typically engage in or services from our, our major vendors. So, uh, so far behind to order roofing tiles, so far behind for this or that, we, he puts a list out. So we we're, every week we're checking in on that and then we're publishing to the office what those delays are so that people can plan for that. They can be uh, prepared for that as best as they can be. And it again, it just takes extra step, extra coordination, extra communication, but we're, we're better informed and we're better able to help navigate uh, with the policyholder the circumstances that we find ourselves in because we have that information. Yeah, I'll offer up something that I've seen from from our partners um, here, and and I and I love this example, and I and I'm and I'm sure both of you um, run businesses uh, that are very much thinking this way. So it demonstrated to me that our that our contracting partners are thinking about the entire the the holistic picture here, right? And so there was um, I don't remember what appliance it was, but it was either the the fridge or the the stove that was a very unique item and everything was ready and that was going to take you know the two months or so to get in right but it was such an item that right like can't really inhabit the home right and you know so maybe maybe there was also a component from the the bathrooms but the contractor said well okay it's a little bit more um intensive for me i'm gonna actually put in a different appliance for you you can move back into your home saving you know the you two months of this temporary living saving my carrier partner two months of that expense and then when that piece comes in i'll come back to your house and i'll swap things out right and i'll take that you know and, and use the the appliance in a different way and so to me that was like that sort of on the spot in the moment like decision making by our contractor partners to to not only think about the customer but to think about the entire process and to say hey this trade-off is, is worth it in the holistic thing. The customer gets home faster. Um, I have a li I take a little bit of a, a hit in having to come back out and, and do the work to swap this out. Um, but the customer and, and the carrier and, and you know everyone sort of gets back to whole much faster. Um, and so I, I loved that idea. Um, and you know our best partners are those right that that think about the whole entire ecosystem. Um, and I challenge my folks to also think that way as well. Don't just think about yourself as the adjustment part of it and the money part, like you are a partner with uh, all of our vendors and contractors on this loss to help the customer. We, we're doing a very similar thing with the uh, insurance companies. We're trying to um, help them to recognize the importance of uh, the timing. So get, get the asbestos testing uh, right away get the engineering going, get the, the plans going. Uh, permitting, at least in our area here, is remarkably slow. And so the more we can push up front, and I, I recognize we're, we're pushing our client, right? But we, we've got it, it's for the better overall claim experiences, is to get engaged, get things moving. And we're also pushing the policyholder to make decisions sooner than they might be uh, typically prepared for. All of that in the long run will pay the dividends off that we need by helping them to get back in because 
as much as we can do to move things forward, we're still not going to be as effective as we were uh, in previous years in getting them back into their home uh, as quickly as we had been. So even with all of that, we're still not going to hit the mark, but it's going to be a lot better than if we don't do those things. I think even on a more granular level, how we view mitigation now, like we may be less apt to rip out a kitchen you know, that has some damage to one of the cabinets that has to be replaced, it's not gonna match, but we're not maybe ripping that out to start, right? If, if obviously mold issues and all that aside, if we can uh -huh. if we can address that, uh, maybe that kitchen needs to stay in place. You know, maybe that needs to stay in place for a month while we do the ordering so that your downtime isn't as long or, or your appliances, you know? So it is making us rethink a little bit how we do the mitigation in those situations where applicable at least. Uh, we are, just almost right up on time here. And I want to make sure that we get your thoughts on all that's going to be happening going forward to, to the most that you can predict. Um, be really curious to, to hear what you're thinking about, um, you know, how things are going to continue to change, if they're going to continue to change and what that might look like going forward. Sure. I'll, I'll jump in really quickly. And I, uh, for one, am I'm really incredibly optimistic about where the world will be and what it'll look like. And I, I wake up with that day. I think, you know, whether it's the generation that's coming and their ability to think and act and operate differently, or how do you marry technology with expertise and human capital? I mean, it's all there. And as from my perspective, you know, in a position of leadership, it affords that. It doesn't mean it's easy, but all good things uh, uh, are not easy. Then to me, every chance is a choice and you have to then choose wisely. And it's easier said than done. But I, I actually see, you know, from our perspective at Sedgwick, we spend a lot of time on uh, D and I, and what does that have to do with this? It has a lot to do with it. I mean, diversity of thought is incredible. And thought comes from different backgrounds and where you grew up and what you look like and where you've spent your time or your age. And when you take that and you harness it in an inclusive way, Brooke, you were mentioning this, you start to come up with solutions. They are there. And it's great that I started the business in 1988. I, there's a lot of value and wisdom to that. On the flip side, it limits me. I have some unconscious and conscious bias the way things should be. I was a loss adjuster. I was a property loss adjuster. And there was a way to do things the right way the old way. And some of that stuff still happens. But as you said earlier, and all of us saying, we've got to think more creatively. And so from my perspective, you know, it was the pandemic that, it, you know, it was the pandemic and then there's storms and then there's the supply chain and the inflation and now Ukraine. And I mean, I'm not sure what's going to happen tomorrow, but I do believe in that underlying belief that if you really love what you do and you believe it's a noble cause that you can wake up every day and change the world for a little bit better, then where you left it the day before. And so that's kind of the philosophy we hear. And it doesn't mean we always don't get it right, but I'm sure we've got room to improve, but it's an evolutionary process. So I'm glad to be part of the esteem panel. I want to thank, you know, obviously our client and our contractors. I think the things that our contractors are doing, I wouldn't have a clue as to how to do some of the things you guys do. And the ability to feel comfortable that you know what you're doing in a very difficult period of time and the fact that you are nimble and flexible and you are changing the experience for people every day and generally in a positive way. I think most of the time it is a positive way when you cut up through all this noise. Uh, hats off to you. And from my perspective, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you. Yeah, I, I think I think just um, as Tom said, you know, I think being nimble and light on our feet going forward as management, we've gone through a couple of years of whoa, I never thought that would happen, you know, to how's that going to go till now going, now where is it going to go? Where are we going to be in a month from now? You know, are we going to be able to get vans? Are we going to be able to get, you know, other stuff that we need to to keep going on? But anybody who says status quo now isn't paying attention, right? It's it's a time to really be on top of your game and to and to make sure you, you can't predict what's going to happen, but, but to be ready for it, whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, we we always have said, right, um, change and, and adapting to change is the name of the game in, in property. And we used to think that, you know, very narrowly about the weather, right? Because you can't predict the weather. You, you think this is going to happen and then this thing happens and you have to be prepared for it. Well, so great news. We've got those skills. We've got that sort of adapting to change and sort of going with the flow and doing what needs to get done in times of crisis. 
now we just have a lot more um, uncertainty to apply those skills to. Um, but, but I think that's the message, right? Like we've been able as an industry to flex and adapt and to change on a dime when needed in, in times of catastrophe. And that is not, not only just weather related now, right? It is, um, you know, pandemic related, it is um, international, you know, um, foreign relations related, it is supply chain, it is macroeconomic related. There are so many uh, things that are shocking our system, but we've got, you know, we've got the, the, the skills to flex and adapt. Um, and most importantly, to not view it as a negative, right? I, I think that's what you said, you know, Tom, you said you're optimistic. And I think if we take that, that, um, hey, change is inevitable, it's an opportunity. Um, we have problem solving skills. And most importantly, we have great partners to do that problem solving with, like, that's a positive thing. And I think that when that change comes, we rally around it and, and we, you know, create something great from that change together. It's a great, I'm glad I got to go last. That, that all great <laughs> points. Seek the silver lining. We always say, um, <clears throat> learn from your experiences. So, um, right before COVID hit, we were looking at a three-year plan to uh, consolidate facilities. We have six um, office locations, all within a square mile uh, of ourselves, and we're like, we need to all get under one roof. So we were putting together a plan, a three-year plan that we're going to consolidate and do that. Well, then the pandemic hits, and we never physically closed the office, but anybody that could work from home, we gave them the opportunity to do that. And guess what? Most did. So then we thought, well, wait a minute. Maybe we need to rethink this. What does the office of the future look like? And so we found that people working from home were more effective. They were more efficient. They were more engaged. But then we started to lose a little bit of the, the contact with them. So how do we navigate looking forward to gain the efficiencies, learn from what this has brought. And it's been a lot of positive. I know there's a lot of focus on the negative, but there's been a lot of positive through it. Um, and so how do we learn from that, be able to improve moving forward, and then yet figure out a way to stay connected so we don't you know, create a different problem by, by uh, the solutions that we have over here. So uh, all, all good stuff, but if, if we look through the history, Back in the um, in the early 80s, when interest rates were just going crazy, you know, we, we weathered that storm there and, and go back to our grandparents time and, and the, the world wars. You know, if we go back into history, we realize, OK, maybe things aren't so bad here. Uh, and 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 we made it through that. What did we learn? How do we do things differently? And we just keep applying and moving forward. And I think that's what the name of the game is. And so, uh, yes, it's that's something that. Uh, I've enjoyed going through, but we're here. We have to deal with it, make the best of it, seek the silver lining and move forward. Love that perspective. Well, one thing that you guys have taught me today is that there's no shortage of challenges, but there's also no shortage of optimism with this group. So um, I think if anybody's gonna be able to solve these challenges going forward, it, it's gonna be, gonna be you, gonna be us. Um, so. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope everybody enjoyed the discussion. Um, thanks for being with us for insights. Have a great afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thank you.